Hello and welcome to the Cuyamonga Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the executive director and president of the Institute, along with my wife, Laura Lee, the director of research, education and outreach. And of course, on behalf of our board of directors, our advisors, our volunteers and supporting members, we wanna thank you for joining us today. Um, the Cuyamonga Institute's an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness in the human experience, following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And as an educational institution, we recognize that to thrive, we take an open approach. And so we invite scholars in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. And that's why we call it Conversation for Exploration. And on these Sunday discussions, we've had a full spectrum of topics, including neuroscience and mysticism, trance states, anthropology, art history, archaeology, shamanism, mythology, archaeoastronomy, and much, much more. And of course, we invite you to visit our website, queermongainstitute.com. All of our presentations are free, and as a nonprofit, we invite you to become a supporting member, and we want to thank you, the community members, who continue to support the mission of the Cuyamonga Institute. Today, we're honored to have a panel of astronomers who all have had a hand in the mission of the Webb Space Telescope. Continuing the tradition of the stunning images that were delivered by the Hubble Telescope, the Webb is the successor and it's 100 times more powerful. Today's guests played a key role in the optics, both in the Hubble and the Webb, they are the mirrors to capture, as they put it, quote unquote, the first light from the first, galaxy, first galaxies in the emerging universe. What Hubble has accomplished with two mirrors is astonishing, and what the Webb, with its 18 mirrors that can be adjusted individually, well, this is gonna be really, really interesting. And throughout history, mirrors have played a, a role in the art, the archaeology, the medicine, psychology, philosophy, technology, and long before optics and styles. So today we fast forward, and we're looking at the latest use of mirrors sent to outer space. The James Webb Space Telescope has been designed to answer many of the core questions and possibly to rewrite the history of the cosmos and reshape humanity's position within it. Well, that glittering night sky has long put on quite the show, and so few of us have had much chance to see it in all of its glory, undimmed by light and air pollution. A mesmerizing, dazzling nightly feature from our earliest days that has informed us and shaped us from the get-go. The heavens, mythically, philosophically, poetically, spiritually, is where we've long turned for answers to those big, big questions. Who are we? Where did we come from? Are we alone? Are we a one-off, the only life occupying a single, tiny, fragile planet? Or who else and what else is out there? How big is this cosmos and what is our place in it? From the first instruments of the first sky watchers to Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and now to this exponential acceleration with NASA and a worldwide team of astronomers and scientists who've been on the job creating telescopes to peer further and further into those secrets so closely held by this mysterious universe. It's breathtaking what they've accomplished. Mm. From our first view of our own spaceship Earth to the spectacular imagery delivered by this beloved Hubble telescope, it's dazzled us over the last few decades, the pillars of creation indeed to the newly launched James Webb Space Telescope on Christmas Day, another gift to the world. Yeah. We are here today to celebrate the science and the scientists who've helped make this possible, to better understand the universe and our place in it. Representing a very long lineage, we have a panel of astronomers. They've all had a hand, as you mentioned, in this mission of the James Webb to design, to build, and to decipher the data once collected. This is the largest and most complex and sophisticated apparatus yet invented 
built and deployed. Uh, we have Bob Woodruff, AKA Woody, optical designer. He worked on both the Hubble telescope as well as the web, a key player in this vast team responsible for this long journey from concept to actual working design, to uh, build, to launch. And Woody, you have fascinating first-hand behind-the-scenes stories of both Hubble and the James Webb Telescope. You join us from Colorado. Thank you for being here today. It's such a pleasure to have you, such an honor. Thank you. We also have Diana Dragomir, a University of New Mexico professor of astronomy and astrobiologist. She is going to conduct astrobiology studies using the data from the James Webb. She'll cover the strategies to detect and measure signs of life beyond our own planet, how life may have originated uh, here and out there, how life is defined, and how she says every aspect of the universe has life cycles. She joins us from uh, Albuquerque. Hello, Diana. Thanks for being here. Hi. And we have, and I have to thank Tony Hull, dear friend, advisor to this institute. We have Tony to thank for putting together this panel of his colleagues. Tony, also a UNM professor, he led the team that spent five years polishing the web's many, many mirrors. Tony will cover the exhaustive tests, many still to come in this five-month journey now that it's been successfully launched to being fully deployed where it needs to be, the data it will collect, and how that was going to prompt us to ask and perhaps answer entirely new questions about our cosmos. Mm. So, Tony, welcome, and we have to thank you so much for, yeah. for this mm. uh, and being such a friend of us, and yet you what travel the world uh consulting and as he says so humbly oh i put objects up in space yeah. well <laughs> what, what are you doing yeah. what are you doing it's so it's so spectacular and all the people that you know so yeah. tony you. do you want to uh take us a little further and introduce a sure. little bit? let me just say a few intro introductory things thank you so much paul and laura and great appreciation for what what you and the institute is doing this is a great dialogue between science and consciousness and so many ways of looking at the universe. And there are really very few places where this can happen. And so I'm very pleased to be able to be part of this. Um, it's really neat that this is the anniversary of, of uh, birthday of Felicitas. And, uh, and I, I appreciate that too. Thanks for your comments. And I'm especially thankful for, for Woody, Bob Woodruff, um, who has not just worked on, on the Hubble, the Hubble fix, virtually all the instruments of Hubble he designed, uh, but he's designed many other space telescopes. He is the most uh, proficient space telescope designer I know of in the world. So it's a great, great privilege to have Woody here with us. And with Diana, uh, I, I'm so pleased at this, the insights that she has, the energy, the intensity, uh, the look at the, at, at the world from the biological point of view. It's, it's just marvelous. So I'm, I'm really, really pleased about this. And, uh, and uh, well, well, thank you for uh, pulling this uh, team yeah. together to really from beginning, middle and uh, end, we're gonna hear the story of uh, these, these instruments. And it's so exciting just to see further and deeper, um, to see beyond the edges of the known universe is what this is all promising to do, to bring us those spectacular images. And I have to say, Woody, every time that I see a Hubble image, I really have to stop and just appreciate and marvel and go into that state of awe. So um, thank you for your hand in delivering that gift to all of us. So, yep. So Tony, where do we begin? Well, I think we should begin at, at the beginning with Woody yes. and and uh, the Hubble trouble. What, the Hubble trouble. What, what was what was happening then? And and the cartoons coming out about Hubble needing eyeglasses and things like that. And then something marvelous happened. And what do you take it off? Take it from here, please. Sure, sure. Yeah. But you um, just let me know when you want the slides changed. Yeah, please change. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I I'm Bob Woodruff and I'm honored to be here today. Thank you very much. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the Hubble, the Hubble problem, and how we fixed it, and then I'll wander into JWST. Um, 
I should have made a sketch here. The Hubble basically is a telescope, two mirror telescope that images behind the primary mirror. And it, 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 there, there are science instruments that lie behind there that, that, that collect the light that, that, Hubble, that the Hubble telescope has put there. Uh, there are axial instruments that are like four, 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 four butter cubes. And they're about two meters long. They're about the size of a, of a, of a telephone booth. And then there's a radio. Um, the problem with Hubble was it made a, the primary mirror is a very perfect mirror to the, to the wrong Connie constant. Uh, we could go into how that happened, but uh, uh, I was, um, Hubble was launched in 1990, April 1990, and I was down at the, uh, the uh, Astronomical Society meeting down in Albuquerque in mid-June, and there was no Hubble presented there at all. Um, so I, I, I went back home on that, on that Friday, and Tuesday I was sitting in my office having lunch, and, uh, and Wally Meyer goes in and says, you and Merck Bottom need to be on the plane today. There's going to be a meeting at Goddard tomorrow. Mm. So I went to the wake, the meeting at Goddard, <laughs> hot, sticky room uh, filled with uh, scientists who had put 30 years of their life into doing this. Wow. And and the, and the Hubble problem w w was described by a friend of mine, C C C Chris Burroughs, uh, maybe the smartest man I know of in the world. Uh, and each scientist that stood up and said, we can't do anything with this. The image was screwed up by a thing called spherical aberration, which is another thing we could talk about. But what, what it meant was uh, we could not get good images through, 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 through Hubble. So how did we fix it? Well, I was working on an instrument called the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, which was going to be a second generation instrument. Hubble's designed to where astronauts could go up and, and take in instruments out and put new ones in with new technologies. Uh, and uh, so uh, I, I talked to the principal investigator there and we we came up with, well, we what we need to do is to, to we need to, 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 to put an air back in that, that compensates the air on the primary mirror. So the idea was to image the primary mirror, this 2.4 meter diameter mirror onto a, a piece of glass that's maybe 20, 25 millimeters in diameter. And that piece of glass would be figured into a potato chip, basically. So the, the it would di the directly add or, or sub, 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 subtract the air from that's on the primary mirror. Uh, and it, it's a thing called an anamorphic A sphere. It's a toroid. An, an, anamorphic, it has, it has to two different radii, and then it has high, higher order. And I know this is, this is uh, things that a sketch would help and time would help. But, but so the idea was to image the primary mirror point by point onto this onto this new mirror. Uh, and at the time, you know, this is the way I approach problems. At the time, I went back home and said, can this be done? So I did three different designs. I, I did three different designs. One was I called an external relay. This was used in, in, in CoStar, where you would deploy two mirrors outside the instrument, and one mirror would image what we call the pupil, the primary mirror, on, on, onto a, a mirror that we didn't even know could, could, could be made at the time. Um, and then there's the internal one used on, on three different um, Hubble instruments. Uh, and, 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 and that one had a mirror that imaged it onto in, in, in internal. And that's what we put in the Space Telescope Science, or we, we put into the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph. And then I did a third one because I, I hate to add mirrors. I want simplicity. So can we do it with a single mirror? Mm -hmm. Well, we could, but for a very small field of view. Uh, so, uh, so that was the process. And then we went through a year of reviews and they did, mm -hmm. uh, they, they looked at the, at, the, at the fossil record of the manufacturer of the, of the telescope mirrors and they found the error. They, huh. 
the the actual error had been measured. The actual error had been measured uh, by a uh, a thing called a null corrector, and, and by essentially measuring the the length of a, of a meter with a a meter stick that that, that is uh, in error in length. They had, they had designed it in they 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 designed it correctly, but they had assembled it incorrectly, and and um, so so anyway, so you knew what to fix, and yeah. there was so much writing on that fix. Right, right, and and you had how did you choose of the three designs? How did that determination get made? Okay, that's a good question. The the external one would de deploy the mirrors into the the space of, of the of the telescope where you just could, could not get space there. The way CoStar did it was they pulled out one instrument and put a new instrument in that, that deployed the the, 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 the mirrors in, in into that space. But but you just couldn't do it with the interface. So it had to be the internal one. And the internal one used on STIS, it had to be that one because we needed a 50 arc second field of view and we could not get that with a single mirror. The the CO S instrument, the cosmic origin spectrograph, uh, is in the the deep ultraviolet, and they want a minimum number of mirrors, and it, but but they had a very small field of view, so so there we used it there to save photons. The the by adding two additional mirrors to the Hubble telescope, it turned it into a four mirror telescope, which eats photons, <laughs> eats photons, and so. Uh, so so that's how we selected um, oh wow and then the fix itself even that was a risky mission wasn't it i mean that was touch mission, and go risky mission and in fact this gets to a point i'll make later that yeah that uh, management does not like to take to take risks <laughs> they, they, they 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 took the risk yeah, and they had to yeah, yeah and as as jim crocker said if this didn't work he was going to take He's going to find the first train out of out of out of town and lay on the track. <laughs> <laughs> and you were the guy that saved the day. Oh my gosh! Well, wow, well, it was designed well, correctly, but then something got missed, and then yeah. it was built with this minor thing, and then you yeah. figured out the fix. And oh my gosh, what pressure yeah. on you? What did that feel like? What did it feel like to to yeah. watch the launch of the fix and then see the fix? I can't even imagine. I, I can say that that year was a very intense year. It took me a year, close to a year, to fig, to, to convince myself that it was possible. <sighs> uh, for instance, that that little the, the the corrector mirror, which which was made by the same company that 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 polished the, the mirrors on 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 JWST, uh, was a there were, I think, four or five different companies in the U.S. that said that they could make the mirror. It turned out the only one that could was Tinsley. Mm -hmm. They had been making weird-shaped mirrors for years, and they, they they knew exactly how to do it. But they were wow. the only ones who could make the mirror. And, wow. uh, and, <laughs> and they made these mirrors for for multi instruments on, on Hubble. So they had a long history in... Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah. thank you for that behind the scenes story. Yeah, but before we go to the next slide, let me okay. simply uh, throw in the comment. I mentioned a cartoon about Hubble needing glasses. And uh, right after this happened and the images started coming down, the cartoon was, and now we have the eighth wonder of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so Indeed. Well, Diana, you have some slides later of what Hubble delivered, but just spectacular. I mean, just just shaped our understanding. Just the images alone shapes our understanding of the cosmos the and what's out there. You've ever seen. Yes, nature created that. Yeah. Oh my. So now we get to JWST, which was called the Next Generation Space Telescope. What I was involved in this. Uh, I attended a meeting in 1995 at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, it, it was it was uh, uh, a presentation by John Campbell about this new mission if we could get it going, and uh, uh, so I started to do design work on it. I I got per per permission from Ball Aerospace to be on the Goddard team 
the Goddard Space Flight Center team, and I designed, um, I did the optical design uh, and and of the telescope and the instruments, uh, and the des design was based upon um, work done by uh, the by a fellow named, named last name Kokorish, who had designed what were called three through three mirror and, and astigmats, and I knew how to to design them because I'd had experience with them in in, in other avenues. And and so, uh, and then in 1997, we, against the advice of our, of our upper management, we proposed on the, uh, on the phase A study and we won. Well, so there was a that? competition and, and a lot of submissions for, for achieving this. Right. And your team with your design won the, won the day. Won. And, and that's won. what's built. And with and, the James and, Webb, wow. That's what's built. And and you wanted me to talk about how. Um, well, I'll tell you what. Let, 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 let's go to the next slide or two, and then we'll come back to this one. Okay. Okay. Here on the left, upper left, you see the 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 primary mirror uh, with its segments, and it segments the lower left. There, there's one segment. Those are the things that 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 Tony built, and. <laughs> And you see, they're 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 kind of in a honeycomb fashion. There, we 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 learn that by watching the bees, and <laughs> they're, they're all hexagonals. And the upper right, uh, you see the center section of the mirrors. In this case, the secondary mirror has been deployed. It's the thing to the left, and you see three mirrors that are tilted off from the center section. Mm -hmm. That was the idea that 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 Wally Meyer and I came up with. Uh, Called to a table. fit it into the rocket so, ship to yeah, have a patent, yeah. And yeah. Um, there were a whole batch of other ideas that people had on how to do this. For instance, have the mirror looking straight up, and and then and then have p p p pedals on the side going up and down. Be very complicated. This we came up with uh, by a, a technique that I will talk about when we go back to the previous slide. And uh, so so that's what happens, and that's the table fold. Uh, the, like the, origami, just fold it up. Well, right. my, my, my wife called it the dragonfly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it spread and its wings. See the, big, the, the, the big silver creature there, that, po that points to the sun. The sun comes up in, that, in the upper right from the, from the bottom. And the telescope cools radiatively to 40 Kelvin. Uh, just due to that shade. So let's go back to the previous slide then, and I and I, pre, yeah, and I, I I will talk about what I've been able to come with up with in terms of uh, how these ideas come into being. The first one is reject group speak. My God, that's what kills creativity. Uh, it just it just you know. It, it kind of puts puts someone in charge that they know something and everyone else just backs off and goes does their own thing, you know. Uh, so, and it, it I say it removes for personal input and motivation. Um, so it's not a contest of personality; it's really a meritocracy of the the right, science. Right, right. The other ideas and how the telescopes, you know, with, with the with the center section looking up and pedals up and down, that came from somebody from somebody's meeting. Of how best to do this and this thing, and but the 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 the, the table fold came about because Wally Meyer and I we set up a big table with paper and and uh, uh, styrofoam and glue and rubber bands and went through different ways to do this thing, hmm. and we spent some time doing that and then we we, we would cr critique it and it all depends upon the requirements. You have to look at what is really required. Mm -hmm. And then go back into your experience, your expertise of how to apply that and be willing to back away from any solution that you come up with. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also uh, note that you had a little bit of child's play in there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, and which sparks creativity. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that, that's in, and it has to be the design has to be simple. Otherwise, it's not going to work in space. Uh, JWST is not simple. It has a lot of, of mechanisms, but the primary mirror and how it folds and how it deploys is basically simple. That center section, you can line on the ground pretty much. The, the, the wings then come up 
they, they can be held rigidly during launch and then they can come up and they form the, the you, you you don't have multiple mirrors to deploy into to and it complicates things um, and and review but I, but we, we review by a small number of people I think to do this sort of thing you it, the the genesis has to be has to come from a very small number of people who are who who trust each other, who respect each other, and who work together uh, to to come up with, with with an idea that will work and be willing to reject any idea that you don't want. Uh, you should also, my experience is, uh, you got to have fun. It's got to be fun. Thank that's you. A, that's a big <laughs> one. And and then there's another one, another uh, thing that I wrote down here uh, that. Uh, don't expect or anticipate that you're going to get recognition. Uh, management doesn't like risks, but management will take credit. And, <laughs> I'm so yeah. pleased to give you recognition today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but that is key. You're doing this for a person. For the love of it. For, for the love of it. You do. Uh, yeah, Merck Bottom, the fellow I worked with from, on, on Hubble, and I would say we we would pay money to be able to do what we're doing. Hmm. The passion for, yeah. I, I appreciate your strategy, because that is so important to know. How does someone succeed against such great odds and with such great responsibility and keep a cool head? You have a strategy. Um, and and this applies to so much in life, I was doesn't gonna it? I say this applies to any all of us mm -hmm. in any in the, yeah. world, the corporate world. These are life world lessons right of, here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I've talked too long. I'm going to turn it back over. <laughs> we so appreciate your stories. Thank you. And thank you for all that you've done. Oh yes, my wow. gosh! Wow. Well, I love I love the way Woody talked about the uh, elements that made this possible and having having fun. I think also it's there's an element of being receptive that ideas come to us. It's not mm -hmm. you can't look in a manual and figure out how to design a, a web telescope. It comes from a, a looking at the problem, studying out the problem, and then the answer comes. At least this has been true of pretty much everything, everything that I've done. Well, we're going to be talking a little bit about the new horizons here and everything from the biological um, element of this to how how the mirrors were built and i'm going to wait on that a little bit heavily because because i was in the trenches for that uh, we talked about time earlier and laura mentioned five years well that seems like a long time to make mirrors doesn't it uh, uh, yeah. polish mirrors well in fact um, when you consider the polishing operation had three hundred and thirty thousand operations in that uh, it, it begins to become more reasonable. Um, and so I will be talking a little bit from, from the perspective of what happened here, but we have to realize in every other part of the web, there were um, similar efforts being made. So um, if we can go to the next slide, or I guess I'm, I'm on now. Are you going to the next slide? I just want to say not only what it's accomplished, but the behind the scenes, what went into it mm. is so stunning and so interesting. I may not understand everything here, Tony, but I'm dazzled by all that went into creating it, right? right? All the science, all the thought, all the thinking, all the history, all the, the, ah, just the details that go into it. So thank you for sharing that with us too. So well, Woody has covered a little bit of the territory on these slides, but but this is Hubble, a beautiful picture of Hubble. And you can see that this is the characteristic telescope in space. And you know, it has its own personality and its own look, but there, most of these things you'll recognize in other telescopes that have been built, uh, Kepler and, and, uh, and Spitzer and, and others that are in space, you'll see similar elements. But we all of a sudden are looking at a different uh, paradigm here. Well, what, what, why are we looking at a different paradigm? And uh, we have this slide which talks about the, the four principal science themes of web. And there'll be probably many more than that, but this is, this is sort of the starting point. And the, the pivotal one that, that drove the design and makes it distinct from Hubble 
is looking at the beginning of the universe. Why is that important? Why does that make things different? Well, I'll, we'll show you a picture a little later of, a, of the deep field picture taken with Hubble. And we realized that we were not seeing, we were seeing very, very distant galaxies, but we realized we were not seeing far enough. We were not seeing galaxies back at the time of creation, which would be represented on the left side of the upper left corner here. And what does that mean? Well, we know we have an expanding universe. And when, whenever you have objects moving with respect to each other, something called the Doppler shift happens, uh, or the red shift. And when objects are moving apart from each other, uh, they become redder, particularly when we're talking about speeds that are approaching the speed of light. So uh, this means that the key diagnostic characteristics uh, that we like to look at for galaxies that, that occur in the, the visible part of the spectrum and also the ultraviolet part of the spectrum are shifted. Uh, the, wave, the wavelength of observation is changed by a factor of maybe 30 or 40 over the wavelength that we would be looking at at a nearby object, a nearby galaxy, etc. So to see back, uh, to see how the universe was at the origin or near the origin, I can't say at the origin, just as Laura said earlier, to, to see the first light from the first galaxies in the emerging universe, we have to go and operate much more in the red, into the infrared, than, than Hubble is designed to operate at. And this means several things. Um, one, one is, of course, we want to have a big telescope. And another is that we want to um, uh, operate the telescope cold. Why? Well, you probably know about infrared heaters. You, you probably even have one. Uh, whenever you do have a heater, it's basically, uh, unless you're, it's blowing hot air on you, it's radiating. And this, this, this heat is coming to you in the infrared. Well, we don't want this, we don't want the very sensitive detectors that are looking way back in time to be uh, looking at the telescope itself. We want it to look at what's mm -hmm. coming from these extremely extreme distances that we're looking at. And so this means the telescope has to be very cold. So Webb is operated more or less at room temperature, a little colder than room temperature. And what do you could tell us exactly what it is? Uh, I mean, not Webb, Hubble is, but Webb has to be operating uh, somewhere between 20 and 40 Kelvin. That means very near absolute zero. So that's why it has to go further out, um, well, far well, away, a five month journey to get to where it wants to stay to start detecting, get away from the planets and the sun. Well, no, that, that's part of it. Uh, but you know, it, it enables a strategy to have this, this uh, amazing sun shield that, that uh, Woody showed us earlier. Mm -hmm. And what do I next? And you can see a you can see a picture of this, of the sun shield now. And uh, the sun is on the bottom side. The sun and the earth is on the bottom side. And there are five stable orbits uh, for when you have um, three bodies. One body is the sun, another body is earth, and the third body is the object that you want to orbit. Gotcha. Uh, and what we wanted to do is to have Webb orbit the sun so that the bottom side is always looking at the sun and the bottom side is always looking at the earth. So these two sources of heat that could come into the telescope mm -hmm. are effectively shielded. shielded. We have uh, something like three or 400,000 uh, watts of energy deposited on the bottom side of the sun shield from the sun. Uh, because it's quite large, uh, we have two tenths of a watt that goes through this and comes out the other side. So it's a very, very effective isolation mechanism to protect the telescope from the both the sun and the earth, which uh, of course uh, represent solar light coming from that. I've heard uh, that the principal source of heat now on the other side is the planet Jupiter, and you know how big that is. So it's uh, it, it's kind of an extreme thing. So I, I just have to also say, looking at this, I just have I'm to sorry. say, looking at this, 
th we had Avi Loeb of Harvard come on and right. talk about, hey, there's something that passed through our solar system that was thin and reflective and might have been a sail from somewhere else. We'll get <laughs> to this when we talk with Diana about astrobiology yeah. and exoplanets. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, this is what Avi was talking about, this very kind of very thin membrane, right? Interesting, yeah. just, I just have to point it out. Go ahead, Tony. Same, same. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, so the telescope side is radiating to cold space, and that's very near absolute zero. It's about three degrees Kelvin. And the telescope, because of this small heat load coming in the other side, reaches an equilibrium, a balance between this small amount of heat coming up and the cooling it's radiating onto the stars and the sky beyond at uh, between uh, 20 and 40 Kelvin in that range. So, so, uh, so it needs to be cold, and, and this shows a diagram of what the orbit is. Uh, as the Earth rotates around the Sun, the, the, uh, the point L2, or I should say the, the halo of A2, uh, there's a, a little bit of volume there, will orbit in synchronous with the Earth. So both the Earth and the Sun are always on the other side, and it can be shielded. So uh, what does this mean when we go to this distant place? No service mission is possible that the Bob described um, described um, for Hubble. Extensive, it does mean very extensive engineering and test. Uh, the telescope will be constructed of different materials than Hubble and materials that behave very well at 20 Kelvin. Mm -hmm. Now you think of mirrors being made of glass or glass ceramics. Um, this is sort of the typical view you have. We are actually, we actually made this out of the metal brilliant, which is uh, rather rare, very expensive, quite toxic and quite brittle. So none of these things are good, but you see the contrast between the, between the two. And Woody is going to add a comment, I see. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I was one of the advocates of brilliant in that, and that was quite a battle because there was all kinds of, of discussions of what should the mirror be made out of. But beryllium won because when you get it down to these temperatures, 40 Kelvin, it has zero coefficient of expansion. It, it is very, once you get it there, it's very, very stable. Hmm. And, wow. and, and it could be made to do infrared and blah, blah, all the, all the other stuff. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah, th uh, thank, thank you, Woody. Of course, there were there were a few problems, and that was that probably only one company in the world was qualified to polish the mirrors, and uh, and there was a, a, a shoot off really where preliminary mirror segments were made of different materials, and and uh, what Woody had had supported, uh, and which his company was involved in, uh, won won that shoot off. Uh, so we uh, did proceed with this, uh, with these expensive brittle poison uh, mirrors, but the material is brilliant, as Woody says, has a very low, it, it, it is not affected in its dimensions uh, by, by differential temperatures, by different thermal loads, uh, which is really nice, and it's extremely stiff. It's one. It's one of the it's hold its shape. Uh, structural materials known, which means it can be made extremely lightweighted. Uh, and I would say you, we, you'll see later, and maybe I'll just comment now. But the back of each of these hexagonal segments is a pattern of ribs because it's they're not all solid material. That would be way too heavy, and uh, uh -huh. the ribs are are only half a millimeter thick. So to give you an idea of how, uh, how delicate these are. Well, let me go on to the next slide here. And, and how delicately engineered. Wow. Yeah, so we also like infrared uh, because we're going to be seeing different things. Not only can we see objects at a distance, but if we go to closer objects, like the pillars of creation, and uh, Diana may want to comment on this too, but uh, we, we can see what we see in visible light on the left side, absolutely beautiful. Okay, we look at it in near infrared light and we're beginning to see different things. We're getting different um, information about what's there. 
and and different uh, we have a different ability to process the uh, the the dynamics the radiative the radiative properties etc of matter in the stars in the interstellar medium the uh, the gas the dust that, that's there and then we go farther in the infrared and and we didn't really have a, the, the right telescope to give the resolution that we want. Webb will correct that. We'll be seeing this at comparable resolution to the what you see on the left or the middle. But we'll begin to see still more as we go into the uh, into the uh, the mid infrared, where Webb is optimized to operate and has uh, everything needed to do that well. So those are the pillars of creation. Would you say this is the most iconic image of Hubble? One of the one of many? Well, I, I, Woody may want to comment or Diana. This is this is uh, certainly one of the ones talked about hugely. Uh, uh, it's it's obviously totally beautiful and and really evocative. Yeah. Uh, talked about a great deal. The other one that's really iconic, I think, is the deep field, which Diana will, will talk about, I think. Or... Uh, I can show it later if people want to see it. I was going to say the deep field and the and the and the ultra deep field and the, yeah. yes There's and so and, what, and Webb will be giving us the ultra ultra deep field <laughs> yeah well, well we'll talk more about that that's a little bit abstract at this moment but let's let's continue here another example uh and it's basically kind of repeating what we just showed it's it's uh what we use infrared tools uh routinely and this is the case of, of a firefighter coming in to do a rescue in a smoky, uh, a smoky building. And in the visible, you see nothing but a, but a, a haze, a, a fog. You can't really see through this. But in the infrared, you're, you can see how uh, the same conditions, the same firefighter can see that there is a victim, somebody that can be rescued. Well, uh, this is the same optical scattering effect that we're going to be using for many objects we look at with web. We will see things differently. Well, we talked about how uh, how far it's going to look and and how it's operating in the infrared. Uh, it will operate on uh, uh, resolution, so it must be big. First of all, take a look at this picture. This is not Webb Telescope. This was produced a, over a decade ago uh, as a public uh, demonstration. And you can see the size of Webb Telescope compared to people, and uh, and it's um, it, it obviously is, is immense. It's huge. Uh, so it's that is needed both for light gathering power and for resolution. So Webb's diameter is two point seven uh, times that of Hubble, and it collects seven or seven to eight times as much light as Hubble collects. And that's and that's that's important when you look at distance. So this is uh, just a, a pretty picture of it, but I, I like it. And uh, you can see a little bit more of what's going on. I, I won't go through all the details on this, but Woody went through some stuff very well here. So we're going to I'm going to talk a little bit about the primary mirror. Uh, actually, I, I made 21 segments. 18 were flowing. And, there, and they were of three different kinds. And so there was one spare of each. And, and, and they act together in the operation that's actually beginning to happen as, as we're speaking. I understand that uh, two days ago, Webb started looking at a, a uh, star, a seventh magnitude star uh, near the cup of the Big Dipper. And this is being looked at, it's much too bright to do science on, but it's just right to begin the operation of what's called phasing up the mirrors to align each to the next uh, in a uh, sequential way. I'm sure there's, um, there's some optimization methods that are used to do this and it's a fascinating thing to watch. So, um, so here are the 18 segments. They were made at the company, Woody said Tinsley, uh, it's now changed its name two times and about to change its name one, once more. But this was the company, a rather small company. It was about 150 people located up above Berkeley. Um, 
and uh, it had the skills. And Woody talked about what it was done, what was done for Hubble. So these are uh, hexagonal segments, and you can see each mirror has a has its own name to it, and and there's something called interferometry. I'm not going to explain that. But for a mirror to perform perfectly, you want these uh, alternate uh, dark and white light stripes to be straight and to have as little wiggle as possible. This shows um, how these mirrors were at one point. Uh, uh, actually, they could have been made more perfectly. Um, we were stopped uh, when we when we achieved good enough results, when we met the, when we met the requirements, we were stopped. And of course, we always wanted to go further. On the other hand, um, uh, cost and time is important uh, in a mission like this. You have to be able to uh, to be very conscious of these things. And um, and also, if you continue to process every every time you process a mirror. You're going to uh, you're taking a certain level of risk, and I mentioned 330,000 operations, 334,000 operations. I think each one of those operations had the ability to destroy a mirror. Oh, wow! So uh, we did not destroy a mirror. We had a, a successful program. It didn't mean that we didn't have have glitches here and there. Uh, at one point, I actually stopped the program for for two months to, uh, to uh, reorient the process. And it was largely uh, to um, ensure that we had the environment that, that enabled people to work most effectively. Hmm. So, uh, so but let's go to where the past starts earlier. And, and I mentioned the material, the, the uh, expensive brittle poison brillium, which also is ideally suited to uh, to uh, 20 to 40 Kelvin operation temperature, and it's also extremely stiff and extremely light. This is mined in, in, in Utah by a company called Materion, and and uh, and and powder is put into huge cans, and and uh, a vacuum pulls all the air out of the cans. And, and, and then it's sealed off and it's put in what's called a hot isostatic press, which will take the, uh, will apply about a thousand atmospheres of pressure and, and about a thousand C temp, uh, temperature to consolidate, and this consolidates the material. The material, the, the mirror segments are then sent to a machine shop and, uh, and they are machined under a, uh, very strict safety protocols because the dust the dust um, is bad for you. It, it, you can get a disease of the lung called borreliosis. And I won't go into details about that, but this is something that, that we have to manage at every stage of operation where, where dust could be produced, including mine. Wow. And you can see on the right-hand side, the on, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, machining marks as the machining is progressing. That's not the final machining form, it's in process. And the right-hand side, you can see these triangles that are used to lightweight the mirror and to, uh, and to, and, and they are the ones that are half a millimeter thick in the wall. Uh, this mirror, if you stretch your arms out like this, you get an idea of how big each segment is. Uh, everybody on this program could pick up this, this mirror without much difficulty. So uh, it then came to my shop, and this is at Tinsley, and we're polishing it. And you probably already can get the sense that, uh, that the uh, mirror is a lot smoother than it was. And this is the kind of operation with giant robotic uh, machines, or actually computer-controlled machines. I don't want to say robotic because we always had an operator on, but we had uh, very special methods that were used to, uh, to do this polishing operation. So um, continuing now, we're, we're, we have 18 mirrors and they get- they, they get After 20 out. years of development and two weeks right. of the most complex deployments ever attempted in space- Oh, we do, yep. James Webb Space Telescope is now fully deployed. Even though the deployments were the riskiest part of Webb's commissioning, getting the optical system to work is equally critical. 
all 18 of Webb's hexagonal mirror segments must be aligned to within 10 nanometers of each other to form a single primary mirror. And that requires making ultra fine adjustments as small as one ten thousandth the width of a human hair. This is a slow, meticulous process called phasing. It will take about three months to fully execute, but when it's finished, Webb will behave much like any other telescope. The tel Okay, I think we uh, uh, you, you you get the idea of what of what we just talked about about how it's going to happen. And uh, I'll just express a little bit. You see on the left, uh, the red circle around the, around the factory. Um, I had a team of uh, 58 people uh, for, for five years working on this, including a number of people who are really expert. And, and during the process, the mirror segments did not stay here. They, they zipped and zagged all over the country. So I simply want to, want to express that, that this is not a static thing. All the polishing did occur in, in, in the facility, but the machining was elsewhere. Tests were being made at, uh, at very low temperature, were being made in Huntsville and at, Go at Marshall Space Flight Center and at Goddard Space Flight Center. And, and test results were sent back. And I can go into much more detail than you probably want to hear about what we were doing there. If anybody asks, I will. Um, so, um, so we, we had the polishing operation. Uh, as the um, your um, polishing started, it was rated as the number one program risk for, 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 for web. Uh, uh, shortly after we got going, uh, this was re reduced. It was taken off the top 100 uh, list. And you, you probably have a sense of how risky some of the operations are. Mm -hmm. I mentioned 334,000 operations. Laura asked, how many do we ruin? The answer is none. Wow. Thank, thank <laughs> <goodness. laughs> okay. And, uh, and then we had the integration of various instruments and the instrumentations, uh, I mean, there were made in, in, in Europe, made in Canada, and made in the US, of course, too. So I, I can't go into the detail on that, uh, but, oh my gosh. but and here is the the uh, the primary mirror with Woody's fold fold Woody's table fold on that, and I did see, uh, of course, early on uh, the some of the the insanely complex deployment uh, thoughts for this, and I'm really glad that it went to this very simple, robust approach, and here it is fitting in. Uh, in the uh, the fairing of the Ariane 5 rocket and you get an idea of how how big this is uh, wow. compared to a five meter in diameter uh, fairing or so, one person's uh, arm length per section of mirror yeah well well yeah both arm lengths <laughs> yeah. yeah so it's it, it it's it's a very big launch vehicle it's comparable to our largest presently, though, though soon uh, a bigger generation is coming forth here. Well, okay, here's a, a, a question and, and, uh, and John Mather, uh, Nobelist and also the, the principal scientist on this uh, uh, gave me a slide that I think is very interesting. And he, it asked the question, how much would you pay for all the secrets in the universe? Hmm. And um, there's a comment which is somewhat controversial about war, inventions, and science. And some of the knowledge and abilities to make brilliant mirrors, um, uh, frankly, developed and, and emerged during the what were called Star Wars in the Reagan years uh, for that, and largely for, for defensive, not, not aggressive purposes. But at that point, there was legitimate concern that there could be a nuclear strike. And, and uh, Star Wars was designed at doing countermeasures for that. Well, let's um, just take a look at how much we're spending on, on an instrument like Webb. And if you compare the amount of spending in North America, Europe, and Japan on space, and there are many different things being done in space, uh, from Earth observing to laser communication to to astrophysics, et cetera. But about one five hundredth of the worldwide space budget is being spent on web. It just puts it into perspective. It's not that mm -hmm. that, that we're um, 
uh, dominating that, and it's something not realized. But uh, so we're we're spending for what we're going to learn from this one five hundredth of the worldwide space budget. So ten billion doesn't sound yeah. that that and, much, and here, considering. No, yeah. and here it is deploying, and of course we're talking about trillions of dollars too. So that's um, we're in a different world. We have, we have to get recalibrated, I think. But, yeah, this is a simulation of of, uh, of web deploying, and uh, I, I think that it, it's well worth looking at. You're seeing, first of all, the solar panels, uh, not solar panels, the, the solar shield uh, being deployed. And this is very interesting how they, uh, they're uh, layers of, of mylar and, and each one is separated from the other and they are and actually in a wedge form with respect to each other. And you'll see, uh, you'll see this, this lifting up and separating them. And this is what gives that huge amount of thermal uh, insulation that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and, and this will take just another minute or so, but I think just to appreciate that this was a key area. And I think one of the three areas people were most worried about. Another is the deployment of the secondary mirror and primary mirror. Mm -hmm. And happily, we're past all these now, and and everything is looking really good. As a matter of fact, I, I heard um, last week a progress report that the launch was so successful uh, and so efficient that it's believed there'll be enough fuel on web to last over 20 years, which is over double what its in initial plan was. Wow. Wow. So we're, we're glad to hear that. Uh, so we're we're uh, we're we're well along. The the um, operation started on the upper left on Christmas morning, and I'm not going to walk through all these these things. But what we've seen now, uh, all these deployments happening, and we're now down almost to the upper to the lower right. And here we're seeing um, uh, at this point we're doing the as we talked about the facing up of the mirrors. We're looking at a star, and uh, and we're um, anticipating that this will be um, uh, really nice. My goodness. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, um, well, I think we're, we're gonna change gears now. All of a sudden. Yeah, <laughs> Diana, um, what are you gonna do with all this data right. when it's collected? We're gonna talk about what does it all mean? What is it gonna bring back? How are we gonna analyze it, decipher it? What does it all mean? Yeah. Thank you, Tony and Woody, though, for showing us the technology and the the design and the deployment and what it's doing. That was truly fascinating. It's fun, so. and it's fun to have a female scientist join us as well. Yes. We get that balance of conversation. <laughs> Skies go shooting off their rockets. Yes, it's good to have the female perspective. Yes. Yeah. Let, let's see how much I can um, I can follow what the uh, email advertisement said, but. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to start off by saying I'm not, uh, well, I'll put this up for you to wonder, um, but I'm not a biologist. Um, I'm an astronomer. Uh, and so I'm going to do something a little different here where I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, a little bit about what web will teach us, but also just kind of a, uh, I, I do spend a lot of time thinking about life elsewhere, uh, even if it's not from the perspective of an expert on life, but more from the perspective of mm -hmm. a dreamer almost. Um, and so I'll, I'll share some of uh, my thoughts, but mainly, mainly science that, that backs up the, the thoughts that I've had. Um, and this anyway, is what you teach I... in your <laughs> courses, right? This is what you, you teach this. Yeah, how, what are... I teach. yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, well, so I teach about planets and planets outside the solar system, uh, planets inside the solar system, which I surprisingly don't know as much about because uh, it's not my area, but I'm learning fast because the students want to know. So I'm going to launch off with a little anecdote here. So a few years ago, I was asked to um, be on a podcast for kids. Uh, I think it's the Brings On a podcast. Some of you may have heard of it. And so the theme, uh, they're trying to make connections between science and something more accessible to children. And so they asked me to talk about what aliens eat. Uh, you know, and, and so the idea there was to kind of teach about planets around other stars right, or exoplanets as we call them, 
by thinking about how, uh, you know, what that means for what some aliens living there would, uh, would eat. So things like, you know, on planets that orbit two stars um, at the same time, they would have multiple sunsets and multiple sunrises, right, uh, in a given day from different different ones of the stars that they're, they're orbiting. And so uh, they might have two breakfasts, two lunches, uh, two dinners, um, or for example, on a very distant planet, very frozen, um, far away from its own star planet, perhaps they'll have a lot of frozen dinners, uh, which also <laughs> means they should have a lot, you know, really good microwaves. Um, anyways, but uh, I was thinking about this recently, then I realized I'm an alien too. Uh, I'm actually a, a resident alien in the US because uh, I'm a Canadian. My citizenship is Canadian. And so, you know, you might wonder what Diana likes to eat. Uh, I like to eat Mexican food, um, good Mexican food, ceviche, I like to eat um, lobster. Um, <laughs> uh, dessert is always key. And of course, once in a while, a little bit of uh, lubricants to wash all of that down. <laughs> uh, anyways, enough about uh, what aliens eat. Let's, uh, let's launch into uh, an astronomer's view of uh, life on Earth. So one thing that strikes me about life on our home planet is that it's very diverse, right? We think often uh or we mainly think about the the life that we see every day uh, my dog was here earlier he's currently absent uh but basically life that is actually pretty similar to us mammals birds um plants right but then uh and and they all kind of use the air that we use <laughs> um animals breathe oxygen and, and breathe out uh co2 right carbon dioxide um and uh we need the sun to survive. We need the heat. Uh, lately, we've been doing without, right? But uh, down here in Albuquerque, but we manage. Um, and so just to kind of go over the things that we may not think about as often, but that is still, still represent life on Earth, uh, you can have life in very extreme conditions that humans probably would not enjoy very much. So for example, on Earth, you have um, life in deep uh, deep sea vents, right, where there's uh, extreme pressure, also extreme temperatures. Uh, so uh, underwater, no sunlight reaches down there, and they, yet there is life. Um, thermophiles, uh, life that it, it can exist in at very, very high temperatures. Um, Xerophiles, life that exists with very little water, um, which is uh, interesting because we often think of water as a necessary ingredient of, of life, perhaps uh, I'll get to that later, but perhaps for life to arise, once life arises, it turns out um, some of it can make it without uh, the presence of or too much water. Um, and then, you know, just to kind of highlight a few of them, and of course, life in very cold conditions also in Antarctica. Uh, I'm not going to try to say those words, but it gives you a sense of how um, life can exist and, and even thrive in very extreme environments, right? Which might make There's us no wonder one about... recipe for life. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So this is where we have life today. Um, but we still, you know, humans weren't around back when life arose on Earth. So we actually still don't know all that much about uh, how life arose. We, we know a little bit the theory of it, right? So um, uh, and, and there, I should also mention that there are <laughs> a couple of ideas of how life happened on Earth. Um, one is uh, uh, that it arrived from the cosmos, um, so that's panspermia. Um, and the other is that it just happened on Earth. Uh, it's important to note that even if it arrived from the cosmos, it would have had to form somewhere else initially, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's um, the question is, is, you know, the question that you ask is important. Is, is your question how life came to be on Earth or how life came to be, period? Mm -hmm. uh, so panspermia can be a way to bring life to Earth. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit more about how life Did it get started be. once and then spread? Exactly. Or is it starting multiple times because exactly. the conditions that are is... out there and there's different recipes for life? Um, yeah, yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Um, so, so panspermia, just, I'm just very briefly going to touch on it because we don't really have, um, it's, a, it's a theory, I suppose, but I don't know that we have evidence for or against it right now very much. I mean, it's just as hard to imagine panspermia having brought life to Earth as it is for, to imagine life appearing here because it is actually quite difficult um, 
to make life. Uh, so, but, but we have tested whether uh, life could survive the trip on a meteor or a comet to come to Earth. Um, well, tested. We've tested um, what kind of conditions bacteria can uh, survive. And it turns out that most of them can't handle very extreme conditions, but a few, one in 100,000 in one experiment, can handle being exposed to a very, um, very hot temperatures. Like, for example, a rocket exhaust would be about, uh, I have this in Celsius, but it's similar, you know, what is that, like 2000 Fahrenheit, 3000 Celsius. Um, you can also have some bacteria survive uh, liquid helium bath, uh, so which is about minus 269 Celsius. That's pretty close to absolute zero. So it's not, you know, so far, it's not crazy to think that perhaps life could survive the trip to Earth. So something to keep in mind as I move on to kind of more, more basic questions. Um, so on Earth, we know that there's a lot of chemistry here. I'm, not, I'm also not a chemist. Um, but just the very basics, you need uh, the molecules hydrogen cyanide and hydrogen sulfide. And those are actually pretty common. Uh, hydrogen cyanide can be made uh, either just with uh, meteor impacts uh, that produce enough energy to combine carbon, nitrogen, and, and hydrogen into this molecule that is wow. HDN, that is hydrogen cyanide. So it's not too hard to make that molecule. It's just a molecule. It exists everywhere in, in space. Um, hydrogen sulfide, similarly, is fairly common. Uh, and then combine all of that to UV radiation. And we think that that's what it takes to get amino acids forming. OK, so now amino acids are, don't necessarily float through space as much. Um, they're a little more rare. You need those other three ingredients above, those two molecules and UV radiation. Um, and then amino acids plus energy, like solar energy, the sunshine or even volcanic energy uh, work together to make polypeptides, which eventually, all you need to know is that eventually those make the proteins, which are needed to make um, <clears throat> to make DNA and RNA, which are kind of the beginning of what we think of as, as life. Um, so there are a lot of steps here. <laughs> uh, it's actually kind of interesting um, uh, that, <clears throat> Uh, oh, I think I, I thought I had another uh, build here, but I wanted to say that very recently we've been able, not we, but biologists have been able to put together, so this HCN here is hydrogen cyanide, H2S is hydrogen sulfide, uh, and UV radiation um, is UV radiation from the sun. So they've put this together in a box, <laughs> presumably a more complicated box than a standard you know, Amazon box, but uh, they left it there. And it turns out that over time, those actually went directly to making RNA strands. Huh. Wow. Um, and so, wow. and, and the RNA is not life, but it's almost there, right? So uh, for life to start, you really need to get into the cells. Um, even so, extremophiles, do they also need amino acids and RNA? I mean, the, the farther range of life that we even see here on Earth? Yeah. Does RNA it operate pretty much the mm -hmm. same formula yeah. as us? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, viruses are a different story. I'm not gonna talk too much about those. Um, but uh, but life as and, and it's unclear whether viruses count as life. Um, but things that for sure count as life, the extremophiles I mentioned earlier also need us. Yes. Um, so even though we're starting to make a lot of progress, this is this result actually of the two molecules plus UV radiation is from 2017. So very recent. Um, uh, yeah. So this is a big step forward. Uh, to show that you can just put those molecules there, mm -hmm. give them time, <clears throat> and they will make, make RNA. And that was a big unknown previously. We didn't know whether you needed something else to kickstart them, mm -hmm. uh, or whether you could just put those two chemical molecules with radiation there, and over time, they will by themselves assemble into RNA. It turns out they do. Um, but it's important to know that so far, uh, life has not been created in the lab. Okay, so going past the RNA is very difficult. People are trying. Um, and so is it difficult to create life? Does it take too much? I mean, is, yeah, so let's, let's actually take a look at um, what we might need. Oh, that's not supposed to be there. <clears throat> that's too much of a hint. Uh, but I wanted to ask, <laughs> maybe, I know, right? Uh, I wanted to ask, um, uh, it's just one element. Uh, in the chat, maybe if people can throw out ideas, 
for what uh, they think we need for, let's just stick to Earth-like life because so far that's kind of all we know, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to see, uh, I'm sure you're going to hit on a lot of the right, the right ideas, but I want to get a sense of, of what people are thinking. So let's take 30 seconds and see what people are thinking. Um, can we okay, well, I'll add something. You know yeah. how you take a test tube and you put your chemicals in it and there's got to be some spark a little lightning bolt, a little heat, a little something to combust and get things moving. I would say the quote metaphorical lightning bolt needs to come down and, and start things moving and interacting. Similar to the, the stars that made all these elements, smashing things together to get a reaction. That yeah. would be my answer. Mm -hmm. Wow, uh, that is a question I cannot answer. Um, but I'm going to stick for now with the elements people are suggesting. So sodium salt, um, people are saying H two O and carbon. Um, anything else? Think about think bigger picture, not just molecules. Mm. Mm hmm. Chance. Yeah. Luck. That is Luck. that. We think that for <laughs> the people. <laughs> Water. Yeah. Yes. Solar light. Water. Yes. Anything else? The sun. Okay. Yep. 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 Well, and right. that so let me solvent, show. right? That solvent, that water supplies, yes. maybe there's another element that can do that. I don't know what that would be, but. Exactly. And it's something to think about. So let's start with the idea of life on earth. Uh, not that I have very much about life elsewhere, but just to kind of get you thinking. Um, and then we'll get to James Webb in a moment, I promise. Um, so let me see if I can bring these up now. Water. Uh, yes, we need water as a solvent uh, primarily, it turns out, for these reactions to happen in. Um, to eventually build the uh, polypeptide chains and the proteins and eventually RNA DNA and all of that. Uh, we need uh, some type of energy, right? Uh, maybe it doesn't have to be the sun, but we need, we think we need warmth uh, at the very least um, so that, you know, we have seen extremophiles earlier, um, but those extremophiles presumably formed in liquid water and then kind of went off to live in a water in vapor form or, or frozen water, uh, ice, right? But for you need the right temperature so that you can keep water liquid uh, initially for life to be able to arise through all these reactions. Um, you cannot use water as a solvent if it's if it's in vapor form and definitely not if it's in ice form. I see, so that limits the temperature. For yeah, at least at the time of when life first arose. Uh, the moon, uh, I put a question mark. Uh, because this is a little more, um, it, it's, un we don't know, we weren't there when life first arose on earth, uh, humans weren't, to study this. Um, and so perhaps the moon uh, was critical to life arising, perhaps not. One idea is that uh, perhaps it was not critical to life arising in the ocean, but the fact that we have tides because of the moon mm -hmm. is uh, what we think may have brought life from the ocean to the land. Mm -hmm. um, is that the only way to do it? We don't know. We know that it helped, it probably helped in our case. Would it have happened without the moon? Can't turn back time. So question mark. But just to show you that there are a lot of elements that may have played, played a major role. Um, Jupiter, you might not think of Jupiter as a, as a uh, factor, but Jupiter and Saturn, especially early in the solar system's life and when um, Earth was just developing at the beginnings of life, it was they, those two gas giant planets were actually helped block uh, comets and meteors, um, or anyways, not maybe not meteors, but bigger rocks like comets and asteroids mm -hmm. from hitting the earth and destroying uh, this life that was just arising. And then uh, you can imagine that perhaps nice. it takes too long for life to arise and it kept, and, and earth gets hit every time, um, you, might, you might just never be able to really get past the first steps, right? So perhaps uh, this played a role as well. Um, and By then one other big objects, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So one other thing that we can think of is at least for um, more advanced life, uh, do we need a quiet star? So the sun is thankfully not very active in terms of solar wind and flares. I mean, there are some, but it's not too crazy. Um, it's not particularly radioactive. We also have an ozone layer that is absorbing a lot of the UV light that would damage us otherwise. Uh, I guess it still does <laughs> if you don't wear sunscreen, but um, is it necessary to have a star that's not particularly uh, harsh in x-rays or UV wavelengths? Maybe, maybe not. 
You need know. a nice little incubator for life to get started. Yeah, um, but we think that on Earth this played a role as well. So do we need, and of course the elements that I uh, that were, were shown up as a, to get you started uh, for life on Earth, we need carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and of course the water, right? Hmm. Do we need all of this for life on Earth uh, to have arised? Would it have arised regardless? You tell me. Um, I want to add in one other ingredient that is much more abstract. And that is um, not happening for me right now. Let's see. There we go, time. Oh no, you went too fast. Okay. Uh, so time, uh, but actually first, before I get to time, Woody has a question. Oh, no. Do you? The, I was gonna say time, so anyway. <laughs> okay. okay, great. We are in sync. Um, so the reason I bring up time is two, so two reasons. Um, but right now I'm going to bring it up for the idea of how long it actually takes for life to have to develop, at least on Earth. OK, so this we know fairly well um, it, and it is an important ingredient. Uh, so here is a little chart uh, in billions of years. So that is a lot of years. Um, but don't think too much about what the number, the actual billions of years and what that means. Think more about the relative times. So 4.5, 4.6 uh, billion years ago, Earth formed. Um, and then about uh, the Earth, so the earliest direct evidence of life, so fossilized life, uh, is uh, recently discovered also in 2017 in this um, apex um, uh, canyon or region in Australia. I'm also not a geographer. <laughs> can only do that much. Um, so that that's evidence of life having a, a rise in three and a half billion years ago. So maybe three quarters mm -hmm. um, of our uh, of Earth's life, uh, or one quarter of Earth's life into its life, right? Um, and then to go from here, I'm just gonna jump across all of this, but you can have a look. To go from here to say even the dinosaurs, that's most of the Earth's life. Okay, so that is you know three three and a half billion years to even just get to like um, three three billion years to even just get to hard shelled animals and three and a half to get to the dinosaurs and then there's the humans so this little um, egg shaped symbol here is basically how long we've been around uh, in numbers that's six million years okay uh, don't worry, don't think too hard it's Sunday about what that is relative to four and a half billion years. But just look at it on this chart here. It fits in this egg, okay? And this is how long we've been around and how much longer are we going to be around? That is a good question. <laughs> um, but here I want you to focus on the fact that it takes a lot of time for life to emerge in the first place. One billion years from formation of the planet to first life, and then three billion years to get to like life as we think of most of the time, okay? So perspective. All right, so switching gears. Now we want to look for life elsewhere. And so people are looking for life in the solar system, but uh, my expertise, which is great, we should look everywhere. Um, my expertise is life on planets outside the solar system, life on planets around other stars, those called exoplanets, right? And so it's actually really hard to study exoplanets, way harder than the solar system, way, way harder than studying uh, Earth and its history. Um, and so we have to take all of those factors uh, that we talked about earlier that we think brought were necessary for life on Earth and bring it down to just two of them. Um, one is getting that liquid water temperature so this is what we call the habitable zone. So we're trying to find exoplanets that are not too close to their stars, so that they're not too hot uh, or too far away, so they're not too cold. We're trying to find exoplanets. I mean, we're finding them all over, but if you want to look for life, we're find, trying to find them in, in this region where um, we think the temperature is just right, the Goldilocks zone uh, for liquid water to exist, okay? And then the other thing we're after because it's, like I said, it's really hard to check all the other boxes, but these ones are a little easier, like the habitable zone. The other thing we're after is size. Um, we don't know any better at the moment. Uh, Earth is the size of Earth. Earth is Earth-sized. Earth has an Earth mass, right? So we're gonna start with what we know uh, and try to find planets that are similar in size and mass to the Earth. Uh, 
Okay, great. So now <laughs> with just those two criteria, because again, it's very difficult to check for things like moons, um, activity uh, of the star, uh, oceans and things like that. With just those two criteria, let's see how many exoplanets we have found so far, okay? So remember habitable zone and remember uh, Earth-sized or approximately Earth-sized, okay? Um, first of all, we have found, a, I, I think these numbers are changing every day, but about 150 exoplanets in the habitable zone. Hmm. Don't get too excited. Uh, of any size, Prim those are ma mainly um, uh, gas giants, okay? Mm -hmm. So large exoplanets, mm -hmm. but okay, we have to start somewhere. So we know that planets exist in the habitable zones of their respective stars. Um, 15 exoplanets, uh, again, of any, of any size in the habitable zone of a sun-like star. It turns out not all stars are like the sun. And in fact, most exoplanets uh, that we are discovering are not around sun-like stars. And there's a variety of reasons for that, um, which I won't get into, but there are stars that are bigger than the sun and stars that are smaller than the sun. And those latter types are the ones we're more interested in. Um, so fifth, so if, you, if you think that you need a sun-like star for life, then that's why I'm putting this number up here, okay? 15 exoplanets in the habitable zone of a sun-like star. Uh, zoom out again, 270 Earth-sized exoplanets around any kind of star at any distance. So some of these are very hot, some of these are very cold. Most of them are not in a habitable zone. Okay, oh. four Earth-sized exoplanets in the habitable zone. Um, I think this may be like five or six at this point. Uh, but it gives you a sense of the number, right? So yeah. that's not very many. But remember the sun. Okay, so so far, oops, uh, gonna go back one slide. Um, so this is not showing up here, but I will say that there are uh, so far no Earth sized exoplanets in the habitable zone of a sun like star. We're that you found looking. yet. Okay. Yeah. So I will say, I will say just this and then not talk about how we find them anymore unless you have questions. Um, it's very difficult to find Earth-sized exoplanets in the habitable zone of a sun-like star. So it's not that they're not there, it's that it's, they're really hard to find. Mm. But in practice, then we're not, we haven't found any, so we can't yet look for life on a planet that's exactly an Earth analog. Okay, they may be there, but we're, we're having a hard time detecting them. So we're, that's where we're at in the field right now in terms of uh, uh, finding Earth-like Earth planets, right? What does Earth-like even mean? Um, okay, so I'm just gonna show you, this is the only science uh, kind of uh, lecture type thing I have, I promise. Uh, but this is how we detect um, and study the atmospheres of all of those exoplanets I mentioned. Uh, basically, we look at the shadow, um, that is cast by a planet as it passes in front of its star from our point of view. Um, so you need pretty special alignment for that to work, but we have thousands of planets that have that kind of special alignment that we know of, so it's okay. And we observe this, what we call a transit uh, at different wavelengths. And that gives us information about what is in the atmosphere of that exoplanet. Um, and so James Webb will look at a few dozen, at least, but if it really goes for 20 years, maybe a few hundred. That'd be great. That'd be great. Maybe a few hundred uh, exoplanet atmospheres, I hope. Um, and search for molecules. Okay, what kind of molecules? Uh, a wide variety of molecules, but astronomers who are interested in searching for life or signs of life will look for molecules that indicate life on earth, right? So this is actually a spectrum. I don't know how many of you have seen or see spectra on a regular basis, but basically it's more, it's, um, it's a way to measure uh, as a function of wavelengths, what is present in the atmosphere or in any gas, right? In this case, this is a spectrum of earth and we can see these lines and they represent the presence of molecules like ozone, methane, carbon dioxide, water, Etc. 
Um, and so we want to get a spectrum like this, but for planets around other stars, for exoplanets. And search perhaps for water, first of all, um, carbon dioxide, but it turns out carbon dioxide is actually pretty common in the universe, in the galaxy at least, and on exoplanets. And it does not mean that there's life there. Um, can be created in even other in the ways. solar system. Yeah. What was that? It can be created in other ways. That's right. Yeah. So one thing we're after, if we want to look for life, like life on the earth. So that's an important caveat, right? Then we might look for oxygen. Uh, but we also, we also want to look for methane. Uh, I'm not going to explain why we need both. But except for except to say that oxygen is also an element that can be created without life. It's a little it's it's getting tricky. Astronomers are currently working on exactly, you know, trying to figure out what kind of fingerprints we're looking for in order to have as much confidence as possible that we have detected in the, a hint that there might, might be life on an exoplanet. Okay, I got a question though. So free mm -hmm. oxygen in the atmosphere was a rather late development in the whole biosphere journey yeah. of life. It yeah. was when there something mutated and certain bacteria started to emit oxygen and then life flourished on that. But for a long period, there was life, but there wasn't the free oxygen in the atmosphere. So there could be, I mean, look at the various stages of Earth and, and its progression. Yeah. yeah, which stage are we going to look for? Which stage are we going to recognize? What about a a young life starting up on a new planet. Exactly. Yeah. So I think light, like life in the uh, deep ocean, right? Early life, the earliest life. We think that's where it started in the deep ocean vents. No, mm. no oxygen from that life. Uh, in fact, yeah, possibly too. almost no sign of it at all because mm. it's so deep underwater. Uh, at least no sign in the atmosphere. So different signatures depending on what phase the life that you're looking for might be. Yeah, in. that's an excellent point. Yeah. Um, so with this in mind, uh, again, switching gears, but this has a point of life, I promise. Um, so I'm involved in a big program that is going to be studying the atmospheres of a lot of different kinds of exoplanets. Um, and I'm also involved, so this is all James Webb, right? And this, and I'm also involved with a program also with the Webb telescope that will study a, the atmosphere of a lava planet. Um, and so this is a planet that is extremely unlike anything in the solar system. Uh, I'm only going to say a couple of things about it to give you a sense of that. So the closest planet to the sun in the solar system is Mercury. And it orbits uh, the sun in, um, I always forget that number, I think it's 70 days. Something like that. I, I will stand corrected if someone comes up with the right number. But basically, it's a few tens of days, right? Um, this planet, this lava planet, orbits its star in 18 hours. No. So wow. if you think of the distance between the center of the star to the edge of the star, what we call the radius of the star, yeah. this planet is three times that away from the surface of its star. And it's huh. tiny. Okay, so this, what is this planet doing there? <laughs> Why is it not um, sucked in by gravity to hit the sun. How did it get there? Why don't we have planets like that in the solar system? Um, and so this is all to say that in our quest for exoplanets, uh, perhaps in our quest for exoplanets like Earth, what we're finding is a lot of exoplanets very much unlike anything we imagined. These are challenging our very idea of how the solar system formed mm -hmm. because it doesn't work for this planet. Um, and this is just one example of tens of different kinds of exoplanets that we could not imagine. So mm -hmm. even though I'm studying this exoplanet with Webb to understand what it's doing there and what it's, um, the composition of the lava is, probably not to look for life in this case. It's, it's a little too intense of an environment. Yeah. yeah, and we don't think it ever was less intense to give life even a chance to start. Um, so even though there's probably, you know, no life on here, uh, it got me thinking about all these exoplanets that we're discovering are so unlike the solar system planets. How do we know that life elsewhere will be just like life on Earth, 
right? We have to really get imaginative and think about um, what life elsewhere might be like. So uh, of course, this, this also makes the problem much more difficult. If we say, well, now we can have um, maybe a silicon-based life rather than carbon-based life. Um, or get even more creative and talk about arsenic-based life. I'm, I'm thinking all the elements that are around carbon in the periodic table. Uh, with all of that in mind, do we even know what we're looking for anymore when we look at the atmospheres of these exoplanets? Maybe you don't even need li liquid water. Um, and so on the one hand, this opens the, the mind to the idea, to idea, the idea that life could be anything, it could be anywhere, mm -hmm. but it also makes it difficult to know what you're looking for, okay? Mm -hmm. If we don't know what it's like, what are we looking for? Um, so that's not, I mean, that's not so terrible. <laughs> um, I think it's something to maybe think about. Um, this actually should have been my last slide. I do have one more, but it is a, ni a nice way to kind of... Well, they're still worth studying because these um, odd planets may be have other conditions for the formation of planets or solar systems, it's going to tell you something, right? It's going to open yeah. up your your thoughts about what are the laws that govern this, the formation of the bodies in the universe, different yeah. conditions, different types. Yeah. And that's exactly right. We It's taking us back to basics, right? If we think we, if what we thought we knew about how the solar system came to be and Earth came to be, if that turns out to be wrong because we're finding all these Systems not like the solar system, and we kind of have to, you know, it's a bit eye-opening and 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 humbling in a way, right? Maybe we have to go back to basics about everything, and not just assume that we we know how all of this came to be. Um, okay. And actually, this gets really small exciting. subset. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so actually, I, I am gonna maybe just stop here and since we've gone on for a little while and take questions, and I can show some of the other slides uh, sure. if it helps yeah. answer some of the questions. Sure. Well, what an exciting field for all of you that you're in. And uh, go ahead, Paul. No, and for us as well. Yeah. <laughs> for us to be able to follow this conversation and be a part of this, well, this exploration. And uh, similarly, it looks to me like you mentioned in your life lessons, Bob, uh, Woody, that we can't have favorites. We can't assume anything. We have to throw out what we think we know. We're going to have to do this with this data coming in with all of these telescopes. It, it could threaten the Big Bang Theory. Who knows what it's going to overturn? We just can't assume that we know anything, mm. is what it seems to me, other than how to deploy and get answers, to, to get new data, to pose new questions. I guess yeah, I would rephrase that. To determine what, what, what the question is. Uh, Thank you, to even help us formulate guys, the very questions. Yeah. Do you want to take questions, or should we choose them? What do you want to do? Sure. And Tony, do you have any particular questions from the chat that you want everyone to hear that no, were posed? Let, let's let people raise their hands if, if they can. Let's start with that. There are some great questions and comments. Uh, you, you know, Sherilyn had one about uh, about different forms of life. Maybe she would uh, speak to that. Oh, Sherilyn, another astronomer. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, it just, uh, there was a lot of good commentary from others as well. Somebody called, you know, the, oxygen forming on the earth you know the great oxygenation and from the perspective of the life forms that would come subsequently that's yeah. true right we wouldn't we wouldn't be here without oxygen yet yeah. that Pretty you know there's also the, the yeah. woody pointed out that, that there's uh, it was poison to the extant life forms or some of them mm -hmm. at the time right and so one one organisms food you know or you know nourishment is another's poison then that's a good perspective i think to 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 keep in mind i, I have a question uh, i'm curious about uh that spectrum was fascinating to me just to see the earth's spectrum remotely and i'm wondering wh what the source you know because you're pretending that you're not here you know you're looking at our world from afar and seeing what what ingredients and what that looks like and what those magnitudes are and i i loved seeing that and i'm wondering what its source is um how do you kind of get back from the earth and see it as a as an exoplanet if you will that's a that's a good question so i'm not sure what the source of this specific one is but i know that one way we can do it uh without leaving the earth 
is by looking at the moon. Mm -hmm. So light from the sun going through the Earth's atmosphere, landing on the moon's surface, and being reflected back to us. If we can measure that light, um, then what's in the reflection spectrum, that is the components of, uh, of uh, Earth's atmosphere. Earthshine. So, so it is the Earth shine, right? The way in which you know Earth looks the moon in the mirror, if you will. So exactly. that that becomes faint enough that that oh, that's cool that it has that source of information in it. And the moon but doesn't have an atmosphere or almost none at all, so it doesn't add anything to that spectrum. So it's pretty clean, actually. The light neat. Off. Yeah, yeah. That's so neat that we look at our reflection in the moon and get that information. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah thanks. You just need photons from other planets. You just need photons and the things are very dim and they're near something very bright. So, yeah. yeah, that's uh, that's actually an important point. We don't, uh, we almost never see planets uh, in an image independent from their star. So the, the, what I showed earlier, the transit method, um, we don't actually get to see the planet move across the star what we see is the star dimming mm -hmm. for an hour or two or 10 while the planet is in front of it. And we measure how the brightness of the star dims a little bit and then goes back to normal. And that's what tells us there's a planet there. So it's fairly indirect, but we know that we have ways to determine that the only thing that could cause that um is a planet sometimes it's not a planet and then we can find that out too yeah to, to woody's comment there's an analog of what it would be like to see an earth around a, another star and it's something like seeing a firefly flying around a lighthouse at full blast at you <laughs> uh, the, the contrast ratio is is a uh, 10 10 uh mm -hmm. 10 billion to one something wow. like that yeah yeah, yeah. so we're, it's it's very hard to find them but we're fine right? fine yeah. wait Slices, yeah. Yeah, but by, by the way, uh, this is yeah. probably going to happen in a quarter century. Uh, the, the National Academy came out with their recommendations and there's a great deal of activity that has been going on since when I was at NASA, but it's, it's coming into a new fluorescence now with the National Academy's recommendation. And uh, so expect to be hearing about mission or mission concepts that will do direct imaging of Earth, among other things. Hmm. That would be great to actually have a photo of another Earth. That would yeah. be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be fun to to see a betting pool, not not for exchange of money, but there a betting pool on which um, which hmm. sacred cow is going to be overturned, you know, first, and in what order with new data. So the winner could get a Jeff Bezos flight to out of space. <laughs> <laughs> out of space. Uh, there you go. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Diane, could you elaborate a little bit about, um, you know, I was fascinated by that slide that said, you know, we found this many exoplanets overall and this many Earth size and this many, you know, and then the last comment was, you know, no, uh, Earth sized worlds around a sun-like star you know in other words our more precise configuration discovered yet could you comment a little bit more on the this the meaning of that given that you know we have limitations on how where we've looked right but you know how much that's this is hard to find technologically versus um this is you know statistically rare yeah we we know um so when you don't find anything all, all that you can say, you can say that um, there are, you know, this, this many stars have an Earth-like planet. All you can say is, at most, this many stars have an Earth-like planet. Because mm -hmm. uh, if you haven't found any, then you can, you, you know that they're not more frequent than, but you don't, so it's like an upper limit, right? You can say, there must be fewer than this, but we don't know exactly. And that upper limit is not too bad. It's still 10, 20% right now, something like that. It's not, it's not too strict. Um, and that, I mean, that's pretty good. There are billions of stars in the galaxy, more than that. Uh, so 10, 20% is plenty. But the reason it's so difficult to find them is because uh, this method, that's why it'd be great to have these, these imaging telescopes an extension, uh, decade or two to actually take a photo of Earth if we can 
uh, find one close enough to our solar system. Um, but it's very difficult because the farther away from the star that a planet is, the less likely it is to be seen to transit. And that's just a geometry idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe you can think of a, a fly in front of a, a, a light outside, a street light. Uh, if the fly is really close to the street light, it can be kind of at different angles and you'll still see the dimming as the fly goes in front of the street lamp. But if the fly is really far from the street lamp, you have to get perfect alignment. I see. Or the fly yep. to block out a bit of light. Mm -hmm. So it's really just, we have to look at enough stars. Uh, you know, if every star had a planet, we would still have to look at something like a thousand stars to find one Earth sized planet. But that's not the only difficulty. We have looked at a thousand stars, even more. Um, the very amount of dimming that you need is also something like a part in a million. Uh, or actually, it's more like a hundred parts in a million for an Earth-sized planet around a sun-like star, but that's actually still a pretty tiny signal to detect. Um, even with our best telescopes, uh, we need to go bigger. Webb will help, but Webb is not a survey machine. So it's not designed to just search. You have to know- Target. You have to know there's a planet there. So, these kind of two issues go hand in hand to make it difficult to find Earth-sized planets around sun-like stars. Uh, so we're still looking. Yeah. So, so concurrent to that, you've got, um, and Woody, you mentioned the deep field and the ultra deep field views that Hubble gave us. And it really is so stunning to see a thousand little yeah. Milky Ways, little galaxies on edge and, and different configurations and spiral, you know, that they just, these little objects, you realize are entire solar systems and galaxies. So how do you see inside, I mean, what's the distance from earth that you can actually start to now discern a planet around a sun and not just a solar system out in the distance? How do you drill down into it to see something that fine within one of those bodies? What's, how far from earth can you, are you actually surveying? You know, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. It's not very far. Yeah. Not very yeah. far. We're certainly within our solar system, or with, with, within our, our universe. I mean, I mean, I'm within our, our galaxy. Yeah, within our Milky Way, yeah. 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 So we now, can I, extrapolate what we find here to the rest of space, I guess, because we have no other data to go on. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not sure someone else would only answer that. Could I, I could I just say, say this is an educator's question because I think in order to frame it for people, mm -hmm. you know, the stars that Diana is talking about are within our Milky Way galaxy and mm -hmm. they're way far outside of our solar system where we think of our planets, right? These are other star systems far away, but still in our Milky, Milky Way galaxy, still in our island of stars in the universe. Those deep field images are looking way outside of our galaxy yeah. to the hundreds of million galaxies that may exist outside of our own galaxy. So these exosolar planets are very, very close to us compared to speaking. these yeah. little specks that are, you know, a, a million galaxies in a field of view. So I think we have to kind of all keep in mind the structure, you know, of our star system, our solar system. That's one of, you know, hundreds of billions of stars in a galaxy that's one of a hundreds of billions of stars in a universe yeah. right so um the immensity yeah. is just mind-boggling yeah. and we can think of our galaxy as our own neighborhood we can start to explore that and, and even those you... stars diana how far away you probably can answer that question and what is the stellar neighborhood that we are seeing with kepler and and these missions that are within our own galaxy that's not so far away it's only so many light years, right? Because it takes. That's the, right. Something like order a hundred or so light years, uh, which is not that big. The galaxy yeah. is um, how many thousands of light years across? I have to. A uh, hundred thousand. Yeah. 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 And so we're we're just seeing stars in you know a hundred light year neighborhood in, in that. In the road, yes. Yeah. So even if we find only five that are around a sun-like size of an Earth size in the habitable zone, even that, if we want to multiply that with the number of gazillion 
galaxies that we're seeing out there in the deep field and ultra feet, there's, there's a lot of potential for life out there. Even well, there, there, like there, our, is, there is, but we have to be a little yeah. careful about that too. There's, there, we have a little potential. dialogue going about, about a book called Rare Earths and, and yeah. Diana alluded to that. Uh, while uh, I think Diana is going to comment, but Emily had a, had a question Web was supposed to launch in 2007. What happened? Yeah. And and uh, and perhaps I can uh, I can say just a few words about that. You know, as Woody alluded to, and, and we were showing you, Web is immensely complex. I think there was initially a very ambitious, uh, much too ambitious, a thought about what could occur. Uh, more ambitious than what could occur from the point of view of funding and what the technology, the technology risk, and what, what's needed to knock down the risk. And little things would happen. I mean, uh, I mentioned 334,000 chances to have a problem in my park. Just imagine all the deployment of the, of the solar shield, how many opportunities there would be for that to do something wrong, and how many times that had to be tested, and how many techniques had to be developed for attaching this in a way that none would rip, that kind of thing. Uh, and this goes on to every part of this. Uh, this was actually recognized in the recent uh, National Academy saying, we, we should go forward with the next mission, uh, which will be doing some of the things that Diana is talking about, uh, direct imaging of uh, XORs, but we should go forward after we have recognized the problems a little bit better than we have today, even though we've been working on it for two decades. Right. And that NASA will be funding uh, specific studies to lower the risk. At the same time, uh, one of the other issues that stretched out the program was, uh, was the ability to fund it. And, uh, and there were times when I was told to slow down work, they even wanted me to stop work, which would have been impossible uh, for reasons I won't go into now. Uh, but they wanted me to slow down to save money. Well, you can't, you can't have it both ways. You can't slow down and, 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 uh, mm. and improve schedule. So there's, there's a lot that's going on, but, uh, but risk, detail, technical details and risk uh, uh, are a big part of why it took so long. I hope this helps, Emily, but thank you for asking. Yeah, good question. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, Laura, to that point, and since we have Woody and Tony, which, you know, it's, it, engineers are less accessible than scientists, you know, right. <laughs> you know, we don't often get the opportunity. And I was fascinated by that one ten thousandth width of the human hair ability yeah. to adjust the mirrors to keep yeah. them, you know, to get them aligned, which is kind of what's going on now. And I wonder if you could elaborate. I mean, just what kind of actuator, what kind of mechanism can actually do that? You know, to adjust something so finely, just well, I think see, the main, I think yeah. The, I think the main thing is to have a control, something you can measure when you do it. The, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and to have this. And, and the, the, the image of the star, if you analyze that, that gives you information that you can use to control the loop. About whether it's smooth. So that's what you're doing. You're diagnosing by making by, Im images. Yeah, yeah, this is what's happening right right now, actually, is we're converging on on having the 18 segments acting as one mm -hmm. uh, of this. We're looking at a star and and we're basically doing something called phase retrieval, where we are looking at each segment and how it works congruently to the next. Uh, we have very fine uh, piezo or PMN actuators that, that, that can make extremely small increments. And as Woody said, we have the feedback loop, which is, which is, which is crucial to it. Uh, this is a, tech, a technique that's been pretty well advanced and, and can be done with high confidence. Doesn't mean it's easy, uh, but-, but, uh, but What I, kind I, of thing is moving it? What, what, I mean, it's just, it's a mechanical they're, adjustment. They're, 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 what they're uh, basically material that will change their dimension by a minute amounts, depending on the electric field applied to them oh yeah okay right it has you're going to be sending signals from earth to the wow. to the web and exactly. say just this exactly. do this do this and then it will send signals back and 
Because it's nothing like, you know, pushing a lever or something, right? I mean, that's just no, way too no, gross. It, it, it is. It's just a very refined lever. <laughs> so so, was, something oh I wanted to gosh. mention in the minute we have left, uh, on all these things you see, we go blindly down the path, putting all our trust into mathematics. Every single one of these topics we talked about, we're going blindly down the path, trusting math, and yeah. coming up with uh, with how you fix Hubble. It's all math. Everything is mathematics. It, it's a language that we share. And and we're, 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 without it, we have no control loop on what we do. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, the, it's the most likely language is not not to share with another set of advanced beings, right? I mean, it's the most likely thing we, pi, we would have discovered a rational number like pi, right? We, that's what we'll have in common. Thank you. Uh, Monica Cronenberger has, has a question that's been up for a while. Maybe we could hear from Monica. So it's, uh, it's um, oh. back to the, to the imaging of the, of the Earth is, because right, until now we, we just see, see the shadow because the light is so dim of the, of the, of the planets around the other stars. So if you now plan to image other, other planets, you first need to find them. You can't image something you don't know where it is. So first you have to, to have something scanning the, the universe for other planets to find other planets to have an image of them. Yes. So the images can only be taken from, from planets already found before. So actually that is a great point. Um, uh, we will, the imaging will happen blindly. Uh, I mean, people are trying to find a, a way to find those planets beforehand. But in reality, in practice, maybe we can find one. I think possibly more like none. Uh, we will have to go look blindly. And so we will have to hope those planets are there. Well, it's, it's, that's the biggest, will you, will you, hang on. So, um, so will you rely on systems like Plato, which will be, I don't know, will be launched in some years and will scan the, the, the universe? No, we will not be able, if we see a planet transit, and do the shadow uh, uh, technique, that means it is not far enough, strangely, from the, sun, the star to actually be imaged. The planets we will image will not transit because their odds of transiting, first of all, will be one in a million. And second of all, if they transit, then you, it means you're looking at the system from the edge. But when you take a photo of the planet, ideally, you want to take a photo from kind of above or below or at an angle, which means you're going to look at that system from a direction that will never allow you to actually see the planet transit. So yeah. we'll have to search blindly. But I think Tony wanted to add something to that. No, I think I think simply that, that the number of stars that are near enough to see an exo-Earth are very limited. Yeah, we have, what, 100 and some odd candidates. And so we'll be looking at these. Uh, we may or may not have ancillary information. Plateau, I, I'm not quite sure what it can do uh, uh, for this. As, as but as what a, I'm most excited as, about as, is yeah, the please. first light of the first dawn of the universe. I mean, there's so many more data that this web will bring in that will really ask those intriguing questions. Well, absolutely. The planets are one thing, but you've got a lot more data that she'll be bringing in. What are some of these other questions that we can ask? Well, well there are the, the four science themes that we, we had back at the beginning and and the, the time will be distributed between these. Uh, yeah. Web, Web is not primarily a planet characterization telescope, right. although this is one of the four main main science themes for it. Uh. So you, you can see um, again, uh, uh, formation of galaxies the beginning of the universe, planets and the origins of life and the birth of stars and, and proto-planetary systems. Yeah. Uh, the, these are, are the main themes that it will do, but but I'm sure that Webb will look at uh, more, more than this um, and uh, we'll just see what happens. Yeah. But, but, but there will be emphasis and priority towards these themes, but they're not exclusive. Yeah, wow. great chart. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful well, chat. Um, there were several other comments in the chat room. I've been trying to follow. Monica Bowles, did you want to? Oh yeah. You had a, a point or a question? I saw. 
Turn on your mic. It's so miraculous uh, that yeah. we have life on Earth at all, and it's so miraculous that we have a universe that supports mm -hmm. creation as we know it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and even the question, even when you view the development of humanity itself as it moves all over the planet, I mean, we left Africa and we traveled all over the planet in the Neolithic, I mean, in the Paleolithic, and in the Neolithic, we deepen into place where we are and take on our biome and grow ever deeper. And, and those human bands had no contact with one another. And yet when they, when they met up, they were the same species. They, you know, they, they were very differentiated, but, but they, they had all developed language and they had all developed, you know, developed in, uh, the same kinds of ways. So as the universe disperses, it also contracts in ways that are very similar. So we would expect to see something like, you know, some kind of life in, in, in many places in the universe. So it, it seems like that's the way that things develop. And so then you have to ask yourself how much of this is due to the whole in which we all participate and it brings us to the question of just tell us in general you know and i went you know <laughs> i like to think about that how do we find it i think it's there too my view not it's not a fact it's just my opinion but how do we find it <laughs> maybe within our own um experience and our own consciousness and and our own living yeah. Good answer. <laughs> and and that those you mentioned the Paleolithic, the Neolithic, from the dawn of time, the stars have meant something. Mm -hmm. The stars and symbol and mythology and uh, knowledge and joy and spirituality. I mean, heavens were known to be the pole stars of their era. This is where it's eternal, where the stars don't move. It's that must be where we go. I mean, it's just been always so much a part of us. Culturally, human, yeah. psychically, yeah. The human desire to explore, to build, to go beyond. Yeah. When we look to the ancient ancestors and, and what they created, and we're always perplexed by the pyramids and by this and that, and we're looking at trying to understand this, well, how did they come up with the technology? There's something that drives us within ourselves. And when we look to the uh, the Amazon and the, and the great cities of the, the Maya, et cetera. Well, they were um, all star watchers. For one they thing. were driven, and yeah. I'm, I'm to coming. To, and now we have today's world of scientists that are driven, taking us to these yeah. out, outer reaches of of, of, of space. It's just, uh, just, it's just unbelievable. Well, we need to remember, and I would like you to speak to this, Sherilyn. We need to remember that they saw the heavens in its full glory. We don't today because of light and air pollution. Light pollution. When you see that, when you see the stars unfettered, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, it's mesmerizing. Well, I want to amplify that, that, that. Thank you for that invitation. Um, but I, I want to amplify something that Monica uh, said, because um, we and it goes back to what Diana said, you know, when she asked the student engaging question about what aliens eat. And I love your answer. Right. Because, you know, alien to what? We was we right. Alien to what? We are of the same cosmos. Right. And we, we start to use the word alien to refer to people who are across some artificial border that we've created and <laughs> alien to Earth, alien to the solar system, alien to the galaxy, alien to the cosmos. I think that we have to own that we are denizens of the cosmos. Agreed. Right. Somebody put in the chat. I think it was. Um, yeah. That, that somebody put in the chat that there's Avogadro's number, 10 to the 23 stars in the universe, 100 billion stars per galaxy, times 100 billion galaxies, that's 10 to the 22. So but if you put your thumbs together, there's more hydrogen atoms than the stars in the observable universe, in the tips of your thumbs. So it's like owning that we belong to this universe. And one of the things about discovering other beings in the universe, one of the things in the Drake equation, sorry to introduce a new topic, but if some of you know what the Drake equation, this kind of probability of life elsewhere, one of the biggest factors is the amount of time you exist, right? And so that timeline that, that Dr. Dragomir showed was, you know, showing that little egg-shaped 
missing right on the end of even the evolution of life on the earth right mm. and how could anybody else know about us let alone we know about anyone else yeah right and so i think when we hear about this vastness it can make us feel insignificant but we don't know how common life is we're, that's what we're questing for we don't know how common it is mm. right and so we we also have to own our specialness and our participation in this cosmos and that therefore maybe some first person inquiry such as monica was alluding to such as is the work of this institute makes a contribution too alongside what's going on with with these leading edge scientists and technologists yeah well said i think the age-old yeah. questions who are we where did we come from where are we going what's our place in the whole the whole what is mm -hmm. the what is it and what is our place in it affects all of us and we each have our own method our own path to start to answer it as did our ancestors and as does the future yeah. right we're yeah. they're unanswerable so we'll just keep going inquire, journey, inquire. Yeah. yeah thank you monica for your yeah, questions appreciate it yeah and thank you for joining in cheryl and it's wonderful to, to see you and your amazing insights as well and of Love course it. to our guest today i mean uh woody uh, he shut off his video, but I want to say thank you so much, Woody, uh, for your your what a, what an honor it is to have the you know boots on the ground, as they say. <laughs> those the, in the trenches the doing the, in the actual trenches. work and yeah. what it took. He's he's not the one at NASA with that's yeah. getting all the camera camera uh, attention. But it was uh, a joy to recognize all yeah. your contributions, Fantastic. Woody and yeah. Tony and uh, Diana and Diana yeah and yeah, Sherilyn yeah. Uh, yeah. also in yeah. this whole field. Well, yeah, absolutely. So. Well, wow. this conversation, of course, could be another couple hours if we wanted it to be. And just having <laughs> access to these brilliant minds is What fun. does it all mean? That's what but, we're... Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah. Diana. Final thoughts. Yeah, final thoughts. Final thoughts. Um, keep an open mind. And um, I am looking forward to the new surprises we'll get from Web because there will be. There we will think be. we know what we're looking for. We do not know. Uh, there will be more lava planets. There will be things we cannot imagine. And I want to see what those are. Can't wait. Fantastic. And, you know, not knowing what you're going to get is really part of the beauty of it. You're not limiting it in advance. You're right. just saying, open it up and, and let's bring it. That's science, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, Woody, and then I want to conclude with Tony, who, again, thank you, Tony, for Tony. bringing all this together. But what are your final thoughts today? Okay. Well, I guess my comment, I, I go back, um, there was a, a symposium in, in Paris, I think December 1995, I think that's what it was. And, and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Bob Brown of the Institute talked about uh, how we, we, we live in, in, in a time right now where money's being put in to have us to, to go answer these questions or examine these questions. It's really a very special time. And the, the opportunities arose to, to, to be part of them. Uh, part of that is to take the risk to walk through the door to attempt to come up with solutions. So what I suggest is people, it's hard to make opportunities, but if they arise, take the risk, walk through the door walk mm. through the door and 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 wow. apply yourself so Beautiful. i appreciate your life wisdom wow. i have learned a lot from you today on a personal okay. level yeah. that i can apply to life and when yeah. the opportunities arise walk through the door yeah yeah love yeah. that yeah. thank you it's... thank you you're wise in many ways <laughs> so um tony yeah yeah I, I i'm going to pick up on comments that both woody and diana said and and risk, yes. Uh, we had um, uh, a NASA that was willing to take the risk on this very complex, amazing machine. And uh, sometimes we get too risk averse in space, mm -hmm. where we don't try enough things. Uh, and then my question, I guess, for you all to consider is, is this worth one five hundredth of all the money we're spending in space to have this look at the universe? Uh, look, look at your heart and soul and, and uh, try and answer that one. Uh, I know how I would answer it, but I'm pretty biased, you know. Where <laughs> I'd say let's spend more on living room, less on weaponry. 
Right, which, yeah. which is the Buckminster Fuller uh, yeah. Yeah, concept. So, yeah, absolutely. Wow. Well, thank you all so much for joining. Uh, I will mention, of course, next week's presentation with Bill Halal from uh, George George Washington yeah, University. He's about technology and innovation next and week, how yeah. it's going to help us get to the next level, just like the web and the Hubble getting us to the next level of information. Stay tuned. So, yeah, uh, so thank you. celebrating. I'm seeing some yeses, so that's, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everybody turn on your mics and say thank you to the guests for being with us for a full two hours uh -huh. plus, plus, and uh, say thank, thank you. Thank you. Awesome job. Thank you. 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 Thank you